Welcome to God of Run. This is Will Sanchez. Thank you for tuning in. I am thrilled to have as my guest, Coach Corinne Fitzgerald. She is the head coach for the Mile High Run Club. She has been the head coach for a couple of years. I met Corinne about five years ago when the Mile High Run Club first started. Corinne is the exception to the old rule that youth is wasted on the young. I'm honored to have Corinne, Coach Fitz, as my guest. Thank you so much, Will. I really appreciate that intro. I will correct you really quickly. Um, I just recently became head coach. It's about a year ago. So it seems much longer. It does seem longer than that, right? I know. But I'm really loving every second of it. Okay. Well, I mentioned I was there, I think, the opening weekend, five years, almost five years, maybe over five years. Over five years, because yeah. Because it'll be five years last November. November. Okay. And that was a very special weekend because you had a special event with Back of My Feet. Yes. Karen Skirchberg was there, and I believe it may have been a different event because you guys did so many events during those early days, those early years. Scott Jurek was there as a guest instructor, and he was running it, obviously, as a charity for Back of My Feet, and I was there with Scott. Mm -hmm. Jarek got to meet him, got to meet so many people. I think that was opening weekend. It was the very early days. Um, and that's, I think, one thing that really drawed me to Mile High. Because we always do events and we continue to do events with real runners and people that are active in the community. We bring the community together in so many different ways, which is really amazing to be a part of. It is. So it's amazing. Businesses in New York struggle because there's so many regulations, so many permits, there's so much competition. Mm -hmm. and, and treadmill running, who would have thought that would take off? But you guys showed the way because now we have precision running came into New York. They have their studio. Mm -hmm. theirs. And then Peloton finally broke out from cycling and they have their studio. Yeah. But you guys can claim to be the first to show New Yorkers. And you also now have two additional studios besides the one, that the original one in, I think on West, no, East 4th Street? East 4th, yeah, in NoHo. Yes. Right, right. So got two more studios. Yep. Where are the other two studios? The second one is in Nomad. It's on 25th between 5th and 6th. And then our third one is up on the Upper East Side. My neck of the woods. Yes, and that's on 85th and Lex. That's right. It's the old Jack Rabbit store. Yes. I've been out of commission from um, from Mile High for a couple of years due to injuries, but I've been back to Mile High on the Upper East Side, mm -hmm. and I am I'm familiar with the other two locations. The first one is your biggest location, but this one I was surprised at how clever the the design was because it makes maximum use of minimalist space. Yeah. It's like incredible. Yes. So. I don't know, were you involved? It's just fascinating. Who put that together in terms of where things would go? So I wasn't personally involved with the design, um, but I completely agree with you. I think they put a lot of time and energy into maximizing the space. And as you know, in New York, the space is always pretty small. and you got to make do with what you have. So it was really interesting to see how we have our, it's a two-layered studio. So the first floor is where you check in, our retail is there, and then our second floor, uh, which is actually low it's in the basement level that's where the treadmill studio is they decided to use the locker rooms and make it um, the multi-gender use so now you know you don't have to wait to use a shower if all if all of them are taken um, if the three of them are taken by women you know or men the woman can jump in any other one so um, we really did a great job in creating and designing the studio space um, and it's it's our newest one the treadmills are brand new you know it's, it's been a year but they hold up really well the woodway treadmills two and one. Guys, you've got 30 seconds on the clock. Let's do it. Okay, everything working. Arms, core, legs, every muscle engages to push you forward. Nice. See how that form just cleans up. You're forced to use that great form when you run at faster speeds. Excellent. Final 10. That's it. In five, four, three, Two and one, pull back, 
a great experience from the moment you walk in the door? That's always been true since the get-go. I remember that at the first studio, after a while, people would know your name. So you would come in and, you know, it was like tears, you know, mm -hmm. hi, Will, you know, and that, that made it made it special. Yeah. yeah. The company was also very thoughtful about what products they would to showcase, because I remember Bumpus, the socks, mm -hmm. because they help the homeless for every pair of socks that a person would buy. They would donate one mm -hmm. to the, they still the homeless. Do. Mm -hmm. And your products are always eco-friendly, you know, yes. the, the shampoos, the deodorants. Down to the plastic bags for your clothes. Oh, yeah, yeah. 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 So, so again, I, I commend you guys for for being not only community-minded, but also aware of the climate. Yes. You know, so climate change is a big deal. Yeah. And whatever little bit we can do, it helps. Absolutely, and I appreciate you noticing that because sometimes those things go missed. Um, and for a little while, we didn't have bags for your wet clothes because we were thinking a little more eco-friendly and, um, you know, make some clients a little upset that we didn't offer that. So now we have eco-friendly bags, and we also sell a uh, little bag that's kind of uh, shaped like a teardrop and the bag comes out and it's waterproof and it's reusable so you can keep it in your bag. Um, we have a new merchandise coordinator and retail coordinator. Her name is Alex and she's always done a great job of picking the right things for the studio and puts a lot of thought into it. Excellent. Think of my introduction as so many ways to describe you. One of the other expression is a diamond in the rough and to me you were always a diamond. You weren't rough. <laughs> Even though at the time you were like 22 when you joined Mile High. Mm -hmm. And where do you think comes your maturity at such a young age? So let's go back to the beginning. Tell us where you were born and something about your growing up years. Yeah, so I was born in New Jersey. I grew up in Rockaway, New Jersey. Um, you know, very normal upbringing, kind of suburban upbringing. Um, pretty close to the city, it's about 45 minutes away. Um, my brother and sister, they're both older than I am, so I think that's kind of where maybe my want to be older and more mature always came from because I was always trying to hang out with them and their friends, so I had to be more mature and I had to act a little bit older uh -huh. um, in order if I, to hang out with my sister and my brother and their friends. Um, but yeah, you know, I've, I've actually gotten that a lot where people just say, you seem a lot older than you are. Um, but I, I think I just, I put a lot of passion into what I do, specifically running. Uh, it's always been a passion of mine and I never actually would have thought that I would be running or using running as a career. Um, you know, back in high school, I was actually a field hockey player mm. and I thought I was going to go to college for field hockey. I thought I was, that was going to be my, my career. And yeah, okay, but you're, you're kind of tiny. Is that a, yeah. an advantage in field hockey? Uh, you know, I was agile and I was quick. And okay. I think that's always been my strength in any sport that I've ever done. Not necessarily good at the mechanics of the sport, but I've always been pretty fast. And then I realized that, oh, well, maybe the sport that I'm good at is not the stick and the ball, it's actually the running part. So, um, you know, my senior year of high school, I picked up running uh, pretty competitively. And I owe a lot of that to um, my coaches back then. Um, you know, I had two really great coaches. One of them is my mentor. I consider, I'll consider him a mentor for the rest of my life. His name is Sean Robinson. We coach a uh, running camp over the summer together. So we still continue to do that, even you know, a bunch of years out of school. But he was the one that told me, hey, Corinne, you got to stop this field hockey stuff and you got to start running. Um, and I took it to heart my senior year of high school and I started running and had a little bit of success and ran through college. And now here I am still running, okay. coaching well, running. Let's, uh, let's give a shout out to the high school that got you started. Yes, Morris Hills High School. Okay. Yes. And then college, what was that? Yeah, college was East Strasburg University. Um, and I feel like I've just been extremely lucky along the way. And that's in Pennsylvania? It's in East Strasburg, Pennsylvania. And there as well, I had amazing coaches who, you know, they, they've seen me grow up from year one to year four, and they've really helped me grow as an athlete and as a person. They put a lot of time and effort into making sure that, you know, everything was into place as far as training, schoolwork, life, relationships. Um, so I feel extremely lucky to have amazing coaches that have made my passion for the sport grow. It's a dorm school where you live on the 
campus? I um, actually didn't end up living in the dorms. Uh, my sister lived in the area, so I stayed with her for a year. Oh, okay. um, yeah, and I had some other living arrangements oh, along the way. Advantage to have an older sister. <laughs> Definitely, well, yeah. Was she also <laughs> athletically inclined? She was. She was a soccer and basketball player, and she was just phenomenal, and I think this is where my competitive side comes from, because I was also competing for my affection for my parents, you know, because she was just unbelievable. I mean, she played basketball at Madison Square Garden. She went to the Netherlands to play when she was in high school. Whoa. She just, yeah, she was exceptionally well uh, trained in those sports. Excellent. Um, so I tried to follow in her footsteps, and I just wasn't as good as she was. So I found something that suited me, which was running. Running, excellent. At some point, did the steeplechase became one of your specialties? Yes, it did. So I started that in college. I'll never forget. Oh. Oh, okay. my first my first steeplechase race because I didn't really know how to do it and my coach was like hey I want you to do this race and I just kind of had the yes attitude so I said sure looks fun enough you get to jump over things there's some water involved why not so I gave that a go and it's a seven and a half lap race so you pass the water pit yeah eight times because it's on the first half of the lap but you don't jump it the first time around um, so as I'm coming through the first half lap I'm going to jump the water pit and I hear people screaming no no don't jump um, so uh, that was my first experience thinking I have no idea what I'm doing here and I have no idea how this is gonna go play out but it ended up playing out okay and that's what I did end up specializing in okay I think I introduced you I, I should have that you also an Irish step dance Yes. I started dancing when I was around 12, um, and I just absolutely loved it. I would see it at the St. Patrick's Day parades, and I begged my parents to put me in classes. Um, and so, yeah, I started when I was 12. I danced till about 15, where I started becoming competitive in other sports. And like any other parents, they were like, you know, you got to pick something. You, can, you just can't do it all, because I was missing practices to go to dance, and then missing dance practices to go to field hockey. So I chose sports and, you know, being with my team in high school okay. um, and then I so I danced from 12 to 15 and I just picked it up about uh, three years ago uh -huh. step dancing again. step dancing yes well, but, is that because of, river dance was the big thing on Broadway mm -hmm. obviously I've seen that many times yes I have seen it river dance Florida the dance so inspired every time I see them oh cool I don't know if you know the comedian Jackie Mason but he's a funny 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 comedian and he, he, he made a joke about river dance he said oh I I went to see River Dance on Broadway. I'm going to save you, you know, 50 bucks. This is what they do. And he stood up and he danced. And then they turned around. That's it. I mean, he kind of has a point. That's pretty true. However, the rhythm and the beat and the music, that you can't compare to. Well, you know, you look at that beat, and there's a beat in running. You know, in running, the magical number is 180 beats or 180 steps a minute. Mm -hmm. And in step dancing, looks like it's much faster than 180. Oh, most definitely faster than 180. And it's all about rhythm, you know. It's sometimes you're, it's about making noise, it's about being loud and having some rhythm and doing fun things with your feet and then kicking high. Um, and we usually put our hands down by our sides because back in the day, kind of where Irish step dancing came from, when everybody would be together and it would kind of, you know, the Irish would be cooking down in the basement, um, there wouldn't be a lot of space. So in order to make your way around the room, you had to keep your hands really close to your body and then it would be more about the rhythm and how you, you know, the, the noise that your feet makes. Oh, so what a cool history of that. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Well, let's talk a little bit about your dad. He, he died way too young, I believe, a couple of years ago, at 65. Mm -hmm. So sorry for that loss. That it had to be devastating, but he inspired you in so many ways. So tell us about him. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it, it was definitely a heartbreaking experience. It was uh, no one was prepared for it. We didn't know. Um, there really were. Looking back, I guess there were some signs, but he did have a heart attack. Um, he passed away in July of 2017. Um, but at that time, it definitely inspired me to connect back to my roots, and part of that was our step dancing. And when I think about my dad, he was just my number one cheerleader. He would come to all my races when he could. He'd be on the sidelines and basically up until the day he died, he was showing up at every race and he'd have my water for me. He'd have my change of shoes. He'd always be there for me. Um, 
and he was just, uh, he also is one of my biggest role models, a very honest and straight forward and straight up kind of character. Okay. So um, I want to do better and be better always for him. And I still take that into everything that I do. And I put 100% into what I do. And sometimes it doesn't mean that I'm the best at what I do, but at least I know that I'm doing my best. And he always sends me those reminders here and there. So I picked up dancing. Um, more so right after he passed away because I felt like it was a way to honor him. Um, and I found a, a team here in New York. It's called the Niall O'Leary School of Irish Dance. And I picked up dancing. I dance every Tuesday night and I love it. And it just makes me feel more connected to him. Oh, cool. Where, and, where do you dance on Tuesday nights? Well, it's a dance studio called Pearl Studios. So it's just practice. And then, you know, we might be hired as a dance troupe to do some other dances around the city. Um, and my dance teacher Niall O'Leary, he always puts those together. I think you also dance at the St. Patrick's, the New York City one. Yes, the New York City one, yep. Wow, so how many times have you done that? I've actually only done that two times um, because we also have the parades that we do back in New Jersey. Um, the one to your dad? Exactly. The, the Morristown uh, St. Patrick's Day Parade. He used to organize that. So we go back and we still know a bunch of the people. He's part of the Friendly Sons of St. Patrick's. So we go back, we see everyone that my dad used to know, and they, they treat us like family. Um, I also used to play the drums in a bagpipe band called Ku Cullen Pipe Band. So I I go back and I see all those guys and it's it's a really nice homecoming so I um, I, I kind of split my time this year I'll be doing the parades back in New Jersey instead of New York oh, okay all right well good you know you, you split your love between Jersey where you were born mm -hmm. and New York where you make your living yes well speaking of living you're you're now the head coach but that's that's amazing because you're probably one of the very very few original employees of the uh, of the Mile High Run Club. Mm -hmm. um, instructors like yourself and others that are good, you guys are in demand. Some of you go on to become social influencers, and particularly if you, I don't know how Peloton does it, but every coach there seems to have a, a fan page. Mm -hmm. Like the old guy, Matt Wilpers, started out at Mile High Run Club. Now he's a big deal over at Peloton. Mm -hmm. Lovely, lovely, lovely guy. Love Matt. Uh, yeah, he's a great guy. Everybody loves him. Georgia boy. Mm -hmm. And so something is keeping you at Mile High Run Club because you would be in demand in almost any field, particularly in the wellness field. So what is it about Mile High that's keeping you there? Yeah, so I am the the only original person employee there at Mile High. Uh, a lot of people have come and gone, and in all good ways, you know, moving on to very uh, things that suit their lifestyles a little bit better. So, um, the thing that keeps me most at Mile High, and I think it's one of the things that sets us apart from other studios, is that we really, and it's not to say that other studios don't, but we really base our love and our passion and our knowledge for running as the cornerstone of what we do as coaches. We aren't too showy. Uh, when it comes to the fan base and you know the fan pages um, in fact some of our coaches aren't even on social media but it doesn't mean that they're not great coaches um, in today's day and age it almost seems like you have to have an Instagram if you want to be relevant but we don't take that too much into account well at the same time we do have our coaches make sure that they post and they you know support and be an ambassador for mile high we're more about the process of coaching how you coach how to become a better coach and how to help people be better. Mm -hmm. And every single one of our coaches, they're so passionate about the sport and making people better mm -hmm. um, that that's really what keeps me there because it feels like a very mm -hmm. genuine position and a genuine job. And to tell you the truth, sometimes I don't even feel like it's work. You know, I go in every day with an amazing attitude and I love the people I work with. I love our coaches. I'm bringing on a bunch of new coaches right now. And I can't tell you how excited I am that those guys are, who each and every one of those them have their own story about why they love running um, so 
we're very true to our brand and we never stray from that. It's not a show, it's not a performance, it's real life and we help real life people become better runners. Oh, that's so cool that you love what you do. And you have a couple of really, really, really cool coaches. An Olympian, John Henwood, of course. Mm -hmm. So he's great and he runs uh, your marathon program because yes. besides the guided on the treadmill, you also have your training programs outside and John Henwood runs the, I guess, anything outside to like the half marathon, the marathon, and mm -hmm. so forth. Yes, this is another part of my high that I love. We really integrate indoor and outdoor running. So we have, leading up to any major race, we'll typically do a training program. So for somebody that's never really trained before, they don't know how to get started for their first half marathon, John will put together a customized training program. And we integrate some mile high classes as well. So it will be one indoor class, one outdoor class, and then a long run on the weekends and John is in contact with everyone you know they have direct access to them we have two assistant coaches Yusuf and Liz who help out with the training as well so there's a lot of support behind somebody who might feel very intimidated and confused by the whole process of running a race it can be well the beauty about uh, running on the treadmill nobody gets lost <laughs> You're in that's the true that's true and I think that our founders think that was the whole idea behind the concept was you know we go outside and we run but not everybody is the same pace so how do we keep the community and keep everybody feeling included and not intimidated and not feel like they're a failure if they don't keep up and it's the best of both worlds because you get everybody together they're still working hard but it allows people to really accept where they are and not feel like they need to keep up with anybody else in the back. Well now with your three locations I guess the one on East 4th you near the east side track mm -hmm. so you could do speed work there and then on the Upper East Side I guess you could do long runs in Central Park. Exactly, that's what we do, yep. Okay, oh yeah, and then I think to your long run for Central Park, you actually have additional pacers to help out. So yes. it isn't just one or two people, you yes. have three or four. Exactly, I mean, we'll have about 60 people show up to our long runs, so which is amazing because you'll always find a partner to run with and you'll always have somebody to run with. But we do have pacers to make sure that you're not getting lost on the route and you are holding a consistent pace and they're really there to support you emotionally too. <laughs> which is helpful. Oh, that's helpful. And your website is also your excellent website. I noticed that you have these drop-in things. So you're looking at, at a class, and it'll give you, hey, if you drop in, you know, you only got two hours, but you can know, drop in, and the price is a better price. Mm -hmm. Which is very interesting that you're able to keep track of how many people are in the class. And of course, that is very handy. You guys should have been in Iowa because you probably heard they couldn't count how many people were caucusing, and yeah, they couldn't tell the right. winner. <laughs> I said, wait a minute, what you do is even more difficult yeah. because you got three locations, you got classes from like six o'clock in the morning to eight o'clock, mm -hmm. and somehow you're keeping track of, you know, how many people are in, who's in it, where can we do a drop in, mm -hmm. and, and you do it all seamlessly. Yep, got all of the technology nowadays. That is so cool. And then you have this other thing, this destination thing where, oh man, people like to go, you know, to Spain, to France. And and there you are, you're offering these destinations, what do you call it, wings? Yes, we relaunched our Mile High Wings program, which originally started with Laura Kozik, who is the Team Lipstick founder and coach. So we relaunched with Andrew Samuels, who's a coach for us now, and he's passionate about traveling and running and all things running and traveling. So it was a no-brainer that he relaunched the program. We did um, a ski trip up to Brampton, where people went on runs, and they sat in the hot tub in the snow and it was beautiful. Um, they've done anywhere from hiking trips. They will be doing trips to Spain uh, where we'll be linking up with Laura Kozik again. So it's coming full circle, which is nice. Um, yeah, so we're really excited to see where the wings takes us next. Excellent. You guys do so many amazing things. But I want to cover one last thing. You have all these certifications so you can do your coaching at Omaha High, but you can also do coaching out in the field, the track, and so forth. You have a certification known as POSE. Tell us what is POSE and, uh, and why did you pick that up? Yeah, so I'm actually going to throw this back to my old coach in high school as well because he was the one that really studied POSE first and foremost and introduced all of his runners to it. So every year when we go to the camp, when we do our drills, they're all POSE method drills. And uh, the idea behind POSE method is it's a more efficient way to run. Um, you know, when it comes to different methods, methodologies of running, 
it's not that anything's different. At the end of the day, you're putting one foot in front of the other and you're getting from A to B. It's how you do it. So that's what we really focus on in Pose. Um, so we focus on 180 beats per minute, like you mentioned, um, where you're minimizing your impact on the ground. So you want to, you know, kind of uh, lower the ground reaction force and turn over a little bit faster. Um, you focus on really bending your knees and lifting your heel up so that you can fall forward um, and, and it's almost like you're catching yourself we call running a controlled fall um, so there's a lot of tips that I've picked up from pose that I use even in my classes and cueing people throughout the run being lighter on your feet um, and, and mainly I think cadence training has been the number one thing that's helped improve my private clients and you know the 350 people I see a week at mile high so yeah it's been super helpful. Excellent. I'm not familiar with pose per se. I am familiar with something called uh, barefoot running a la Lee Saxby, who was an original pose guy. For He was trained personally by Dr. Romanoff, I believe his name. Mm -hmm. uh, he may be the only one that can really teach it uh, in its highest form, in its purest form. And it was interesting that you used the word cues because Lisa, I had Lisa Axby here as one of my early guests, and he was extremely, extremely sensitive about when he was teaching, he wanted to teach the right cues. Mm -hmm. And he wanted to keep it simple, like you said, control falling. His takeaway was uh, it was four foot strike, but it had to be followed immediately with a kiss of the heels. Mm -hmm. And you have to also have to be underneath your center of gravity. Interestingly, when I injured my knee, I could no longer run because I was a classic heel striker. And that went straight into my knee. When I ran into one of his coaches, the great Ben Leviscant, mm -hmm. he got me on a treadmill, started me running. But of course, when you run on a treadmill without your shoes, your feet get smart. Quick. Yeah, you are not landing on your heel if you're running barefoot, that's for sure. And then when I landed four foot with the kiss, me paying one away. Mm -hmm. And that's the only reason I could run today. I'm limited to six miles, but that's okay. I'll take hey, it. six miles is not nothing. That's yeah, a long run it. to me. I'll take it. Yeah. With all of those things you were talking about, running underneath your center of gravity, not heel striking and slowing your stride, breaking your stride with every step, you naturally start to run faster and better. So um, I'm glad you're back to running for sure. But you're going to okay. be dancing for us? Yeah. What is the routine you'll be doing for us today? The dance I'll be showing you is a hard to reel. So this this is basically when you're doing shows or a lot of things that you see in river dance, they usually do uh, open or close with a reel. So I'll be giving you a little snapshot of what a reel looks like.